Thanks, Francis. Uh, it's nice to see a uh, nice crowd out because at this moment, our president is giving the State of the University Address. So I'm pleased that you decided to come and learn. Rather, well, anyway, best, best not say anything else. Uh, now, uh, Western Partnership for Wildland Fire Science, I'm going to talk a bit about that at the very end of the talk. Uh, so I'll put that. But, uh, you know, there are some advantages to being a speaker. And one of them is you have a fair bit of latitude. Uh, I think I have to go pretty far afield before Francis bodily removed me from up here. So there's a couple of things in this slide that kind of triggered some memories. So if you allow me a minute or two for, to reminisce, uh, well, I guess you're going to have to allow me because I'm up here and have the podium. So the first thing is... Um, there's no Canadian Forest Service there. I was there for 34 years, and uh, you know this is my second or third talk without it being there. It just seems kind of weird not to be with the Canadian Forest Service. And uh, I'm a very big supporter of government science and academic science, which brings me to my second point. Uh, thir uh, let's see, 18 years ago today was a momentous day in my career and uh, with about 150 others. Uh, the budget in 1995 was given on February 28th, and it closed the Petaluma National Forestry Institute. However, I did not find out about it until March 1st in the morning when the janitor informed us that we were being closed. Now, that's a story for another day, but uh, uh, it was quite a shock. And, uh, you know, and after that, I got transferred to Edmonton. It was my first tr move where... It was not my choice, okay? I did not want to come back to Edmonton. I really enjoyed Petawawa. So it brings back some memories. Okay. Now, on with the talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about fire and climate change. Global, for a large part of the talk, but I will relate it back to Canada and even to Alberta and even very close to home. That's taken from Slave Lake, uh, May 15, 2011. Uh, there was a fire that rolled through. This is taken a few weeks later, but it looks like a tornado went through there. All the houses are gone. Uh, I'm not sure if we need to dim the lights a little bit to see some of these slides. Is there a dimmer on these things? <laughs> it's a nice bright day outside today. I'm, a, I'm very much a, a weather forecaster, uh, meteorologist. It's going to be four to six above today, so... Uh, it's a gorgeous end of February day. Even warmer tomorrow. So, outline, uh, fire background, some climate change impacts, uh, talk about some, a recent global study, and talk about peat fire for a bit, uh, or organic fires. And this slide, it may be hard for you to see, it's a modus pass on May 15, 2011. And uh, Lake Athabasca, still ice covered. This fire here is the Richardson Fire, and the fire that going to Slave Lake is just, just a red dot with a wisp of smoke. You can hardly see it, all right? Um, but uh, it was location that proved to be uh, the key consideration. So and globally, we burned 350 to 450 million hectares, and the reason... Uh, there's such a, a large range is because we don't have um, the exact number yet, the exact science. Uh, Canada's quite good in mapping, monitoring fires. Other countries uh, aren't so good. So that's from remote sensing from the last 10 years. It's about the size of India. So it's a significant chunk of real estate. Um, and if that's our guess on fire starts on area burn, we have no clue as to how many fires there are every year, but uh, millions and millions and millions for sure. We guess about 90% are started by humans. Uh, largest burned area, I'll show you some maps in a few minutes. Uh, grasslands, savannas, Africa, uh, South America, Australia, you'll see it. Fire is a necessary component in a number of ecosystems, including our own boreal forest. So hopefully the animations work. This is from... Uh, uh, Florent Mouliot and Chris Field from 2005, and we just took their raw data and put it into a global maps by decade. And you can see that there's a lot of fire in the globe. 
and uh, Australia, uh, India, Southeast Asia, Africa, South America, not so much in Canada, relatively speaking, and some in Siberia. You'll notice that in northern Africa, um, there wasn't much fire, and that's because there's no fuels to carry the fire. It's, it's basically a, a desert sand and rock and things like that. Very, very little vegetation to burn. So, uh, now area burns one thing, number of fire starts is another thing, but impacts is really what drives a lot of our concern. And like real estate, location, location, location. Um, there's been fires in Australia in 2009, and then this year, uh, Russia 2010, southern United States 2011, 2012 there's fires in Colorado, uh, that's near Colorado Springs in the bottom, and uh, you know this is a global, um, a major global process. Recent uh, publication suggests that there are smoke fatalities in the order of 330,000. No, I did not make a typo, that is the correct number. Um, Johnston 2012. Uh, if you want to look that up. So, bringing it closer to home, um, these are Canadian forest fire statistics, and they're incomplete prior to 1970. They go back to about 1920, 1918 in that area. We burn about an average of 2 million hectares every year, 8,000 fires, 2,000 hectares is about half the size of Nova Scotia. Um, but it's more than doubled since the 70s where the average was about 1 million hectares. And as you'll see, I claim this is due to, wait for it, human-caused climate change. Okay? Not just climate change, but human-caused climate change is responsible for our increase in area burn. Uh, these are primarily stand-replacing, stand-renewing fires, uh, crown fires, which just means the surface fire goes from the surface up into the crowns, and the crowns get involved and the trees die, and you get more trees afterwards, hopefully. Uh, it's highly episodic, from half a million hectares to over seven and a half million hectares. Uh, that was 1995, though 1989 was also very close. On average, lightning fires are about 35% of the fires. They burn about 85% of the area burned. And you may ask, well, why is that? Uh, it's because lightning fires occur in clusters. They often occur in remote areas. and some of those remote areas, there is no fire suppression activities. Fire size, about 3% of the fires that are over 200 hectares represent 97% of the area burned. So a, f a few fires are responsible for most of the area burned, most of the impacts. Uh, the tail wags the dog. Western United States, it's about 99% and 1%. 1% of the fires are responsible for 99% of the area burned. So and here is just a map of Canada, and you can see that uh, this is color-coded by 80s, 90s, and part of the 2000s. And you can probably see where the boreal forest lies from. <laughs> and there's a little break in uh, eastern Ontario. Some people believe that's due to the weather in eastern Ontario, though they had a very active fire season last year, which isn't included in here. Um, Alberta and BC actively suppress almost all forest fires. And you could, it might suggest that BC is, uh, is fairly uh, successful at doing it, at least during this time period. So um, fire issues, we spend about $800 million a year in Canada directly on fire management. Um, and that number has been going up and it will continue to go up. Uh, around the world, it's billions of dollars. California alone probably spends over a billion dollars on fire management. Uh, there's a number of reasons for this. Health and safety of Canadians, uh, priority one. Um, a lot of evacuations are due to smoke, um, not necessarily flames <coughs> the outskirts of the city. Property, timber. As I said earlier, there are positive <coughs> aspects of fire in terms of biodiversity, killing off bugs, disease, promoting health. Uh, but you have to balance the positive and the negative. In a place like Alberta, it's very hard not to try and manage a fire because almost every place in Alberta has a value close by. 
So you may want to monitor and manage or let burn, if I may be so bold, but it's really difficult because in Alberta, there's very few land areas where you can allow that to take place. Traditional approaches may be reaching their limit of economic and physical effectiveness. If things continue to get worse and worse, um, we have to, may have to build a new model. Now, I've had the great pleasure with Marc Prigien of teaching an advanced fire ecology course this term, and we're having a lot of fun. So I just threw up a few things about the boreal. Um, you know, fire is important because, you know, these fires are stand renewing, stand replacing fires. It allows sunlight to reach the forest floor. It gets rid of the competition and uh, removes organic layer. And for many seeds to germinate, they like mineral soil or not too much organic material. Uh, our standard climate succession models don't work that well in the boreal. Uh, many places, what you see is what you get. Uh, black spruce, uh, jack pine, um, when you see them, they burn and they come right back. Uh, there's a number of strategies, adaptations uh, for trees to survive. Serotonous cones, suckering, sprouting, thick bark, avoidance. Um, seed bank for trees isn't a common strategy. Pin cherry is, I think, the only boreal species I know that has a viable seed bank. Uh, avoidance, balsam fir, uh, burns like stink but uh, uh, it, it needs to seed in, so it needs survivors. And a very light fire will kill balsam fir, uh, probably because of the fine roots. Thick bark, well, if you've got crown fires, thick bark isn't going to help you a great deal. But in protected areas around lakes and things like that, so some of the southern boreal areas in eastern Canada, uh, red pine, white pine, the mature trees can survive a fairly intense surface fire. I've seen uh, red pine survive a surface fire of 13 meter flames. So you know, almost 40 feet of flame and it lived. It was about 120, 34, it was about 40 meters tall of a tree. So, uh, but around lakes, like when we heard Scott Nielsen's talk, the fire intensities are, are much calmer or lower than in the, in the mainland boreal. So this is the next, there's about three slides that are key slides in my talk. Uh, the next two and another one are probably summarize my philosophy uh, with respect to fire. And on this slide, and if you've seen any of my talks, this is this, you know, a slide that I use because I believe it's important. I'm not talking about an individual fire here. Uh, individual fire wind is critical. I'm talking about area burned on a landscape uh, for a, a period of time, at least two weeks, a month, or a season, and a region half the size of Alberta or the, all the province of Alberta. These are the things that drive fire. And you know, most of them are intuitive, obvious, fuel, uh, loading, uh, how much fuel you have, uh, how dry is it, uh, what's the structure of the fuels, do you have lighter fuels to carry the fire at the surface up into the crowns. And these are things like shrubs or an understory like black spruce. Um, ignition, of course, human. And lightning, human. There's a trend uh, that I consider uh, a bit scary is that we're seeing more arson fires. And uh, the fires in Australia, a lot of the Black Saturday ones were arson. Slave Lake was an arson fire. Uh, arson fires are common in the Mediterranean, in California. Um, I thought I heard recently that uh, people were convicted of arson and were getting the death penalty in California for starting a fire. So it is a disturbing trend because these arsonists will start fires when the fire weather is critical, when it's hot, dry, and windy, and that's the most difficult time to control fire. Now, the third factor is weather, and I'm unabashedly biased. I believe that weather is the most important factor. Things like temperature, precipitation, atmospheric moisture, sunshine, upper atmospheric conditions, atmospheric stability, these are all key aspects. Now these first three factors operate even if people aren't around. But people are around, so uh, things like land use, uh, fragmentation of landscape, 
we build cities, we convert forests or wildlands to agriculture, and we do try and manage and suppress fires. Now, um, I believe weather is important in its own right, but also influences those two other factors, the natural factors, fuel. Uh, fuel moisture is primarily based on what happens with respect to the weather, how uh, windy, hot, uh, dry it is. And fuel moisture is probably the most critical fuel component once you have fuel, because um, it determines whether a fire will start and how fast it will spread. And also whether influences uh, lightning activity, uh, it's you need thunderstorms, which is a function of the, the atmosphere. So it plays a factor in other two factors. Now, from a management point of view, we can't control the weather, so what can we do? Uh, well, we can do things about the fuel, and we can do things about human caused ignitions, uh, prevention, education, enforcement, uh, restricting industrial activity during high fire danger periods. We modify fuels. Um, now, the United States has spent, I think, a billion dollars on fuel modification. And at first, they wanted to modify the landscape. And they, um, but this is a waste of money, okay? If you're going to manage fuels, do it near your, your values, uh, communities. Because at the landscape level, as long as there's enough fuel, fire is opportunistic, it will just find a pathway. And you have to eliminate about 60% of the landscape fuels to kind of stop fire spread. And that's physically not possible for landscapes like Western United States and the boreal forest. So there's fire and weather linkages, but there's also fire and climate, which are longer term. Uh, atmospheric processes, and some of them are oscillations, some of them are circulation patterns. Um, some people are quite sensitive about the term oscillation. Uh, ENSO is the only true oscillation that we have, most people would argue. Um, and ENSO influences the weather, Pacific decadal oscillation, Arctic oscillations, Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. These all influence the weather. Um, now, if it influences the weather, it influences fire activity. And there's a number of papers out there showing that a number of these influence fire activity in various parts of the world. Interestingly enough, probably the, the best uh, relationship with fire activity in Western North America is with Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, AMO. And you may say, well, you know, don't things move from west to east, speaking from a, a weather pattern in the westerlies? And that's right. So why would something in the Atlantic influence what's going on in Western North America? And the best analogy I can give you is if you see a stream and you see a boulder and you see the wire that comes to the boulder will dip before the boulder. So it transmits information upstream and the same thing happens in the atmosphere. So if there's a ridge or a trough or Atlantic, it means the opposite's upstream over North America. So this is a... There's still a lot of research going on in this field, so uh, it's still early days. Now, I've been talking about climate change since uh, my first talk was 1985, and uh, most of those talks were trying to convince people that climate change was real. Okay? Now, climate is dynamic, it's always changing, but whether humans have an influence or not. This is from NASA web website, I just pulled up, this is uh, from a few weeks ago. And you can see that, you know, we are warming. Though you'll see that, oh, I'm not going to touch this. Um, you will see that um, we have warmed a fair bit. Nine of the ten warmest years are in this century, 1998 being the other one. But the climate deniers are out there already saying, well, we're starting to level off. So where is the climate warming? It's like, you know. They, they, they pick and choose their battles. The globe is warming, okay? And we have warmed and um, will continue to warm. Even if we reduce greenhouse emissions to zero today, there's a lag in the system of decades, even centuries, where this warming will continue. Now, this, I think, is an animation. Oh, man. 
this is an animation. Whether we get to see it or not, ah, oh, okay. This is from NASA, and uh, it shows observations to the best of their ability since the 1880s to present day. Blue is cool, cooler than normal. Yellows and reds are warmer than normal. And as you can see, uh, as we start to get to the 70s and beyond, it's a much warmer world than it was in the 80s. All right? So these are observations, and it's a, becoming a very warm world. Now, they've started monitoring uh, carbon dioxide, which is the primary uh, so-called greenhouse gas uh, responsible for warming. And since about 1959, it's on the big island. Uh, it's a gorgeous place. Uh, you should go there sometime. So you can see that uh, you know, it's carbon dioxide have, has been rising. Pre-industrial levels are about 280. Um, and we're at in the mid-390s. And there's a seasonal variation because we're in the northern hemisphere. And it's going up. You can see probably in the 70s it, it leveled off for a bit during the oil crisis. But uh, it's going up. And here's a, a blow up the last few years. And this was taken a few weeks ago. Uh, I looked on the website today. We're at 395.5. So we'll probably crack 400 uh, this summer in the spike. So, and website if anyone's interested. So, climate change projections. For a lot of the work I've used over the years, we use GCMs. Uh, general circulation models in the early days, global climate models in the later days. You, you choose your your acronym. Uh, the most recent runs suggest warming of 1.4 to 5.8. There's newer runs that are coming out that will change this a bit. Uh, this is the global mean temperature. And you may say, well, is that all that much? Um, well, it's going to be higher for northern latitudes. Generally over land, though the Arctic Ocean is a separate case, and I'll talk a bit about that in a little bit. But you know, if we warm the temperature in Edmonton, the annual mean by uh, four or five degrees, we're down more like present day climate, Montana, Wyoming, uh, almost to Denver area. And it's a much different climate than, than we, what we have right now. So it is a significant change. Also, uh, not just the mean changes, but the extremes. And this is uh, the scary part. Uh, the heat waves, the storms, we've already seen, you know, like San Superstorm Sandy, which was quite an unusual storm. Um, ice storms, wind storms, flooding, you know, the extremes are very important to fire because that's a few critical days is when all the fire activity typically happens. Now there's two maps here. One is observations from a few years ago. It shows warming by decade, and you see areas in Siberia that are close approaching you know one degree per decade all right at that time also uh, North America uh, in the Northwest there's been a lot of warming um, and here's a projection for 2050 from a Canadian model and you can see there are similar patterns there are areas of cooling uh, so global warming doesn't mean universally it's going to be warmer everywhere in the world um, and the models pick this up and you can see off Labrador it's uh, cooler uh, probably due to ocean currents but you'll notice what shows up here is significant warming heat in the Arctic Ocean it's because ice cover is now seasonal. Okay? Uh, perennial ice cover disappears, and it's probably going to be sooner than 2050. And let's see if I can do this. Okay. So uh, 2007 was a, a really benchmark year for loss of ice cover in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, 2012 had even less ice than 2007. And the historical, you can see, is quite a bit different than what 2007 was. And here's models, the GCM models predict when ice cover will be lost. And at the time, September 2007, it was below the most pessimistic projections from the models. At this rate, uh, we'll have seasonal ice cover late to late to 20s 230 235 2035 um, and that will drastically change the climate of that region the weather patterns open water has a much higher lower albedo so it absorbs more solar radiation 
and changes to ocean currents. It's, it's quite a significant uh, uh, development. Now, there's a, a great website, uh, University of Illinois, uh, Cryosphere Today, and you can go uh, in the past and pick any day, and they have ice coverage, uh, Antarctica, Arctic, and more recent years they have snow cover as well, which is really great to see. So I just pulled a uh, same date, one from 1980, and I was up in a little place called Tuk Dayak Tuk then, and yeah, there was ice really close to the shore. Um, and this is from the same date, uh, just picked September 21st of the air in 2012. And you can see, you know, visibly how different things are. So I mentioned extremes, well, and variability. Uh, so how variable will our climate become? And extremes are important. In some places in the world, you have fire and then you have floods, especially where there's topography. Uh, Talk to Olus and Lost Creek and places like that. Erosion, lots of problems. In some places, you need water or sometimes floods before you get the fire. Places like dry parts of Australia, American Southwest. In those places, it's so dry, you need the precipitation to generate the vegetation, which then dies during the hot season and then can burn. Um, we are seeing indications that wind, on average in the future, doesn't change much but there's more extremes, and extremely wind events are critical for fire events, and Slave Lake was a good example of that. So, we saw what's happened in the past with global temperature. Let's take a look at what happens in the future, and this is from a Canadian model. Um, I use lots of GCMs, but I always try to include the Canadian model because, well, I'm from Canada, hey? So, um, Temperature in the bottom, the year is in the top center there, if you can see it, and 2070, 2080, and the world's a much warmer place, except for just off Labrador and some of the southern oceans. Okay, and there's lots of different GCMs, but um, with slightly different patterns, but temperature, you know, it's, it's universal. It's going to be a much warmer world globally. Um, precipitation is a different, different story. So this is work done oh, uh, around 2005, and we looked at, uh, we used two models, and we lose, used ecozones, and we found relationships between fuel moisture and uh, weather variables and area burn, and use those relationships in the future, and you got a doubling of area burned approximately. There is some variation between the models in the east. They're pretty much in agreement in the west. There was some things that were going growing haywire, especially with the Canadian model. But, you know, pretty well a doubling of area burned uh, by the end of the century. These are three times CO2s. Uh, but that, at the time, was they, they thought was shocking. Turns out to be conservative compared to some more recent work. And this is uh, Mike Balshi and others. And they used uh, 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 the Canadian model A2 and B2 and Canada, Western Canada, Alaska, and they found 2.2 to 5.5 times increase in area burned projected using those models, um, which is a significant increase. Now, uh, Nathan Gillette and others um, did some work looking at area burned, and they related to observed temperature, and then they used uh, a GCM, a Canadian GCM, and just had human-caused warming on it, and that's the, the green line, the simulated temperature. And from this, we said that, uh, first of all, that fire and climate weather are related, and that the increase we see is due to warming and due to human-caused warming. So, which brings me to temperature, all right? Um, a number of studies, and not just the one on the bottom, but and many before it, have found that temperatures related to fire activity, in particular area burned, over larger regions, like a province or half a province, over a couple week period or a month or longer. And this is for three reasons. Um, and I won't go in order. Okay, the warmer it is, the longer the fire season is. Uh, 
There's recent work out showing that the fire season has already increased in Alberta. Uh, another reason is the warmer it gets, the more lightning activity you get. The more lightning activity, the more potential fires you have. But the reason that's most important is that the warmer it gets, the greater the increase in evapotranspiration. And it's not linear, it's closer to exponential. And unless there's a significant increase in precipitation, forest fuels will be drier. If the fuels are drier, it's easier for fires to start and spread. So uh, unless you get approximately, and this is work that I'm supposed to be finishing up soon, uh, increase of about 10% in precipitation for every degree of warming. Most of the models don't suggest that kind of increase in precipitation. So uh, now this is some uh, recent global work and uh, use NSEP reanalysis data, global. Uh, it's a fairly coarse grid, and we calculate the fire weather index, including the daily severity rating for the world, 1971 to 2000. Uh, computers are good at this. This is what they're built for. Uh, the King FWI system, fire weather index system, is used across Canada, many parts of the world. It is the most commonly used uh, fire danger system for the globe, for doing global work. We used a cumulative DSR, which I got the idea from Dennis Quintilio, to look at the severity of the fire season. The DSR is a function of the fire weather index and was developed to provide a measure of how difficult it would be to control a forest fire. Um, FWI is related to intensity, but DSR is raised to the power. It's almost like uh, the circumference of a circle. You have more area that you have to fight as the fire grows. So uh, we used uh, A1B, A2, B1. These are different emission scenarios, how quickly the, the globe warms, essentially. Used Canadian, Hadley, and French. The reason Canadian was probably the coolest, Hadley was the warmer one, and the French was right in the middle. We superimposed the KL anomalies on the observed database, uh, the monthly anomalies, recalculated FWI, and cumulative DSR and said, okay, how much did it change? How severe will it be in the future compared to today, all right? And what's, this is a composite. And so we looked at the three models to see if they agreed or disagreed. And where there's the red, all three, um, all three models in the A2 scenario uh, said there was going to be an increase. Two of the three mostly increased. No change is, um, two models agree to no change, and then there's decreasing, and then if all three models disagree, it's undetermined. And you can see that most of them were in agreement, and most of them said that it's going to be an increase. And uh, if you go to 2090 uh, to 2100, it's almost universal that it's all going the same direction. I believe this is largely due to the increases in temperature driving most of this. Now, if you look at an individual model, and this is an animation, um, this is the Hadley model for A2, but they're all somewhat similar. Uh, the red is a tripling of current severity rating, and, uh, and then it goes down to a yellow, which is about no change, and you can see there's very little yellow. Some of the lines go from 2.52 and 1.5 to, and it may be hard to see, but as we warm, uh, the severity rating goes up a great deal, which means there'll be more intense fires, much more difficult to fight. We also looked at season length uh, using a simple metric, uh, using temperature. And currently, some parts of the world are warm enough to support fire all year long. So it's really a, more of a mostly a northern hemisphere. Once again, a composite. This is the A1B model, and mid-century. And they all say it's going to get longer, and by 2090, it's, well, it's the even more agreement, and this gives you an idea. Uh, the red's 20-day lengthening of the fire season, and by the end of the century, yeah, so, you know, it's about 20 days or more for much of the, much of the globe. So, uh, the future. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. You know, I can't say with any certainty. But, you know, these are what our models and our uh, research has shown thus far that, you know, 
it looks like we're going to have a much warmer world. Precipitation is a little more difficult to estimate what's going to happen in the future, but what we've seen is that unless it's a significant increase in precipitation, it won't compensate for the increase in temperature. So we expect more area to burn. We expect more fires. We expect a longer fire season. We expect greater intensity and fire severity. Um, that's a little more complicated, but I'm beginning to expect fire severity in terms of depth of burn will be more severe. This is work done by a colleague, uh, Mike Watton. The maps show 2090 lightning, 2090 human compared to uh, present day. And uh, you can see there are significant increases in various places. These models uh, are still early days. And uh, I, I will mention that uh, we have a project with Alberta Innovates to look at uh, green up in Alberta and fire occurrence prediction. Um, right now, fire occurrence prediction does not consider green up at all, and we hope to include that in the models. Now, Alberta is kind of a strange place. Um, most of the boreal in Canada, the, big, the month with the most area burned is June or July. Now, Alberta has the most area burned in May, and this is due to primarily uh, uh, fire season before green up and that's typically more the southern areas. There is, it's almost bimodal. There is some fire seasons where we get a lot of fire in July, August, and that's farther north and more true boreal than the, the southern regions. So hopefully this Alberta Innovates project will be able to address the human-caused fires, which is something, if you remember the earlier slide, this is something that we can address. We can't change the weather. We're stuck with the weather, but we can change the fuels, and we can change you know, how we deal with human-caused ignitions. Now, I always had a manager who would always say, so what? You know, like, you do all this research, so what does it mean to me? Well, I, I'll restrict my comments to more to fire, to fire management. There are much broader implications. Uh, this is a Landsat photo after the Slave Lake fire, if you were wondering what that was. And um, there's the town. This is the, the burnt areas, and here's the highway. And this narrow ribbon here is what led the fire to town. So it, it, fire is opportunistic. It looks for a path, a wick, to get into town, and it found it. That happens to be black spruce. If that black spruce was not there, um, you know, the town may not have burned. Um, but it was there, and away it ran. So modern fire management today it's an expensive business. It's a challenging business. Um, and it looks like it's going to become even more challenging. Even if, um, you know, it doesn't get as severe as what some of these models suggest, it's still going to be a very difficult time because um, our, our weather is changing. The fuels in Alberta, there's a lot of old fuels that are just ready to rip. And uh, there's more and more people living, working, playing in the woods. And this is a real problem for fire management. So um, it, it's a very challenging situation. Um, do we have to build a new approach? Perhaps. Um, now, in Alberta, we have among the best uh, fire management agencies in the world. But there's many parts of the globe that where they still use essentially brooms to put up fire. And so if we're having trouble with helicopters and wire bombers, people with brooms are going to be completely overwhelmed. And uh, so, you know, and this is a, a serious issue. So I've got one more section and then I'll be done. So I'm going to talk about fire and carbon. And this is important. So even though the fires in the boreal may be, you know, and I'm including the circumboreal here, so Siberia, they may be, uh, 3% of the area burned of the world, but they could be very important. Um, so fire and carbon, there's three uh, considerations. One is combustion, and that's obvious. Flaming combustion, smoldering combustion, uh, greenhouse gases are released. Decomposition, after fire, lots of dead trees, bushes, etc. they decompose, release carbon dioxide. Also, in the boreal, you've gone from a semi-mature and mature stand with the carbon dynamics associated with it, decomposition and photosynthesis, and now you have a brand new, uh, a new stand with a different carbon dynamic. 
But we have a lot of peat in the boreal forest, uh, about 700 petagrams, about a third of the global terrestrial uh, carbon. And this is what I consider legacy carbon. Uh, these peatlands have been building up for thousands and thousands of years. And these peat areas do burn today. All right? And sometimes, if the conditions are right, they can burn right through winter and then start up again the next spring. So, but my concern is with permafrost melting, as it is, and with uh, more droughts in the future, that you know, this area may be, become vulnerable to deep burning fires. And we're starting to see some really deep burning fires already, anecdotally, from recent years. And these can be a significant release of uh, greenhouse gases. Work done by Susan Page in Indonesia, their peat's a little bit different than ours. Um, they did draining and things like that. But their peat fires, the estimate was, was equivalent to 20 to 50 percent of foss, global fossil fuel emissions. The peat in the boreal dwarfs anything in Indonesia. So if our peatlands start to burn significantly, it could be a significant positive feedback. And for those who are firefighters and have fought in peat fires, you know it's very difficult to put these suckers out. So, positive feedback, fossil fuel emissions, warmer temperatures, warmer temperatures, more fire, more fire, more greenhouse gas emissions, and so on and so forth until the vegetation changes or is eliminated. So, in summary, uh, fire and weather are strongly linked. A warmer world will have more fire, changes in forest fires may be the greatest early impact of climate change on forests. Mountain pine beetle people may argue about that, but that's fair. Uh, increased risk in the future due to increased fire activity. What I'm saying is because there's more people, communities in the woods, uh, Ring of Fire in Ontario is going ahead, there will be more slave lakes, Kelowna's, Colorado Springs, etc. in the future. Traditional approaches may not work, and there's a potential for some positive feedback. And I haven't even talked about permafrost and hydrates and, and that elephant in the room. Now, I have a few more things to say. Uh, Western Partnership for Wild and Fire Science. Uh, uh, it's a picture, oh, by the way, that's uh, a fire in Australia uh, taken by Chris Hadfield uh, from the orbiting polar station. Uh, it looks pretty mean. and. Uh, uh, yeah, it's the black smoke and pushing high enough that there is some uh, cloud forming on the tops there. Um, and this is what we're studying at the Western Partnership. Um, and I firmly believe that to, to do good research, you need data. Uh, data is like gold, all right? Uh, ideas and lots of ideas uh, is probably a good thing. Um, Steve Jobs had lots of ideas. Not all of them were great. Anyone remember mobile? Mobile me? No, because no one ever uses it. Okay. So, but he had some really good ideas as well. Uh, hard work and persistence. Okay. Um, but as interesting as the science is, it's all about the people, and we have a great group of students and staff, and it's been a lot of fun, and it's just starting. So, uh, with that, thank you very much.